God damn it. I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. Yeah, good morning. All right. You're in outer space. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> I've uh, I've recently moved. Uh, to outer space? That's awesome. <laughs> I, yes. Today we are, we are broadcasting from outer space today. It's really exciting. Proof that the Earth is not flat, okay? <laughs> um, they need proof for that where I live. <laughs> yeah. Isn't it sad how much people are? My, one of my favorite things is anytime there's any great space exploration or anything, like like the friggin' Amazon dude goes to space and people are like, yeah, I don't believe it. You look under the comments, it's like it's so fake. It's in this. It's they didn't show any good video. Like it's a hologram. <laughs> you know, oh, God. it's so funny. Yeah. Um, no, but I, I recently did move um, and uh, b- bought a house up in the burbs, left Chicago, but. Uh, Oh wow! Um, don't have a studio uh, set up yet. I'm, I'm, the downstairs area where I'm at now needs to be completely redone, and there's still boxes everywhere. And my studio is in the back, and it's just going to be a while. So it's work in progress, but we got a place. So it's baby steps, you know. That's cool that um, you uh, moved out of the city. It's, I mean, obviously it's fun to be in the city, but it's also great to have like money to spend on space. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, I mean, I'm actually. There's a lot of reasons why we left the city. It's just been crazy there, yeah. but um, I've, I was there for 25 years, so it's oh, like wow. it's you like had a change. Yeah, and, and and now I have a yard. My kids can play in the yard, and it's yeah. safe. It's a very safe neighborhood. Good schools. Uh, my dog can run out in the yard, and it's just peaceful and it's quiet. And there's there's no gunshots. You know, I'm not used to that yet. Yeah, those um, things matter. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, people aren't screaming at the top of their lungs at three in the morning, you know, outside, you know, ah, <laughs> dude. so it's nice. It's just an adjustment, but we're actually, we actually save way more money living here than like, it's just amazing that I, I'm, I'm still not used to the fact that I'm, I've got a house and I'm paying less than what I did for what I was renting in Chicago. That's, I mean, that's the crazy thing. Whenever I, when oh. I started my the illustration business i stayed in north carolina because i had friends living in new york who were sharing an apartment with three people who were the same age as me and like they were i knew they were getting the same editorial fees i was for the art so i was like you guys are crazy it's not i mean i'll I'll visit new york yeah but i i want to have my own space and yeah so i get it anyways hey everybody welcome to another episode of face the truth we're just going to jump into this i'm really excited i'm always i I say that every time I got to stop saying it. I realize I repeat myself. I always say I'm really excited, but the truth is, is I'm always really excited to talk to my guests. I wouldn't have them on if I wasn't into them. And my guest this week is a, is a talented designer. He's a talented um, um, illustrator. And I first became aware of him because of the brushes that he was making. I found him on Gumroad and um, I, I'm kind of a, I, I kind of, try to stay as traditional as I can when it comes to digital painting like I, I, I and the, the main reason for that and I've said this many times is because I want my voice my thumbprint so I try not to get too crazy with the digital stuff I like it to just to be a, a good brush that maybe has a little bit of texture but it's not like too you know crazy I can still move it and make it feel like I've sculpted it I have painted and work with it and Kyle's brushes are awesome that way he's the thing I like about his brushes is that um, you can tell this guy knows about gouache. He knows about watercolor. He knows about oil paint and all these things because he makes the brushes feel that way. They work that way and there's like these beautiful textures and it feels natural. So when I found his brushes, uh, gosh, it was probably like six years, five years ago or something like that. Um, I I was just like blown away and I think I wrote them right away. I was like, damn, these are awesome, man. And and I've been using them ever since, um, and we could talk about, you know, I can, t- I can share some of my favorite brushes later, but, but anyway, super talented guy, um, and he was, um, you know, made a, made a sweet deal with Adobe to, like, let everyone else be able, who, who uses a Photoshop to be able to get his brushes, uh, so there's a lot of really cool things. So anyways, everyone, without further ado, please welcome Mr. Kyle Webster.
Thank you. What a what a nice introduction. And uh, <laughs> it was music to my ears to hear you talking about the brush, the brushes feeling that way. Because of course that was my goal all along. To sort of have an artist like yourself, Jason. You know I'm a huge fan. Uh, oh, talk about them it. that way and use them, of course, in your award-winning work is uh, obviously a little feather in my cap. So <laughs> I'm pretty excited about that. Thank you. Yeah, man. Like uh, honestly, like for years. So when I started getting into digital digital painting. I, I, I was against it and I just didn't feel like it was okay to, to do digital art. Yeah. And um, I, I started to dip my toes into it. And then I realized real quick, like, wow, I can actually draw and paint. Um, and for years, I mostly use brush number 24 in Photoshop. That's still really a favorite brush of mine. Yeah. Um, and, um, and I would even use just a round brush in Photoshop and be able to do paintings with it. But you know, it, it took years to develop, to feel like I could just really just be natural with it. And I found that a lot of brushes I was seeing were just cheesy. And I, I would stay away from a lot of brushes at too much texture, or they just, you know, you, you'd paint with them and you'd notice a pattern. If yeah. you painted, like painted the whole background, you'd see like this, oh, damn, that's not good. I have to go over and fix all that crap. And, <laughs> um, but I, I really like, for example, my, my recent time cover with Biden and Kamala, um, that was strictly all oil brushes of yours. Oh, wow. And, and um, I have, I did a podcast um, with a friend after I did it, uh, like a, a week or two after I did the cover. Um, you can watch, and I basically break down the, the process. And so you can see, I show like how I use your, like this canvas brush to like do the underpainting and how I, I basically did like a, um, a Dutch Flemish technique, um, building the painting up from scratch, just using, um, the oil brushes and I, one brush in particular, and I don't remember the name. You always have like crazy names. Yeah, that's um, good and bad. <laughs> yeah, uh, like big, wide, softy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> were you talking about me when you named that brush? I'm gonna, I'm gonna name this brush after Jason. Big, wide, softy. You know what? I'm working on. My... No, it was about a cloud, Jason. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. Um, but uh, but yeah, I, this is one brush in particular. I can't remember the name of, it, but it's it's a difficult brush. And it, it's very, it's got a lot of texture and I, I, I play with the, with the settings on it and stuff, but it's still difficult and it's a challenge because it's, it's actually not easy to work with, but I chose to paint most of my painting with that brush because it, it gives me imperfections yeah. that, that only, that make it feel more natural and more like a painting. And so it's, I, I actually enjoy the struggle when I'm painting because that it, it has more organic and more, more life to it. You yeah, know? I know what you mean. Yeah. So, that, so that's, that's what I, I, that's what I think about your brushes. So they're amazing, man. Dude, thank you. Um, actually, yeah, a lot of the brushes are designed to be a little harder to control just so you get happy accidents or you might get an irregular mark of some kind that maybe five times out of 10 is not what you want, but the other five times is like, oh, that's, that's a really interesting, that left a really interesting impression or a mark or, just some little uh, part of the painting that um, actually becomes a highlight or not something that you would have planned and come up with. Um, I like to take those kinds of brushes and use them a lot for when I'm blocking stuff in or just for background yeah. elements and things like that. Yeah. And then if you need to fine tune, you come in with something a little bit more control, but it's, it's just really fun to work that way. I, I love that because like you, I was trained traditionally. Um, I went to, uh, I had, did a fine art program at a four-year school. So it was all for me just brushes and charcoal and, and everything else. So um, I didn't discover uh, Photoshop until my last year of school. And even then, obviously the, the brush situation was, was what you were familiar with, which was round brushes. And yeah. I didn't enjoy drawing and painting in it at all. Um, so yeah, that, that's me just trying to bring back some of that feeling I had with traditional media into the digital experience. So yeah, it's awesome that you felt that way about them and that you still feel that way about them. And um, yeah, I'm going to continue to try and make brushes that feel well, that way. So, for example, I, I wrote you, you like years ago. You, you, um, what are those brushes called that I just asked you? Monk, the Ever uh, Monk brushes. Monk, yeah, the Monk brushes. Yeah. So you had these. It was like some kind of promotion. You had them available. Yeah. And um, I downloaded them, and they are hands down my favorite brushes. And the reason is, is because they they kind of they remind me of Brush Twenty Four. Uh -huh. Um, but there's like this nice, subtle texture in there. And 
I don't know how else to explain this. If, if you're in a, if you paint with gouache or you paint with oil, you'll get this, but there somehow in that brush that you made, there's like a buttery feeling. Like when I'm painting, like I just did a cover yesterday and, and, some of these quick covers I have to do, I only have like a, a day, two days maybe. Yeah. And um, this brush is perfect for like a painterly feel where I, I'm, I'm able to paint really fast with it because, um, you know, as long as I, I put the details where they need to be like, like the eyes, you know, whatever, but the rest of the face, I can really sculpt it out with that brush. And it has like a nice painterly feel. Um, you know, that's what I like about that brush because it doesn't look, like you're trying, it doesn't, some, some digital brushes are like, oh, we're, we're trying to be traditional. Right. You know, this one right. doesn't, this one feels more natural. And I, a couple months ago, um, or yeah, a couple months ago. So I lost my computer died on me and I lost a bunch of things. And so, um, so I thank you again for, I was like, I need those brushes. <laughs> like those are my favorite brushes. And, um, and so like for the last couple of months, I've been doing jobs and I'm like, man, I really wish I had this brush. Um, cause it was, you know, I can manage without it, but it's a fun brush to play with. And it, and it, there's something about it. I don't know how you do it. I don't know if you can even share some of like what well, you that, go through. Yeah, um, that, a particular, brush, but... that particular brush set was the coolest brush experience, but also just one of the coolest experiences of my professional life. Um, it was amazing. I, I was reached out to by this uh, group of folks from the museum um, in, in Norway, where they actually have his Edward Monk, the artist, and he's the guy. For those of you out there who don't know Monk, he, he did that famous painting, The Scream, which you've all seen, and the guy ah, on the bridge, and it's like it's very expressionist. Um, they have um, his actual physical brushes that he used 100 years ago, sitting in a vault down at the basement of the museum, in addition to a lot of other stuff of his. And uh, this promo was we were going to have a photographer go in and photograph these brushes from different angles. So I got these ridiculous high res photos. They were like 8,000 pixels square of just the base of a brush, the side of the brush and several different angles. And then I would take that information and then I, I built the brush set, which was a very small set. I think it was like six or seven brushes at the most um, off of the photography they sent me and, and all these imagery they sent me of these really extreme close-ups of his paintings. Uh, which was just such a weird, cool way. I've never designed or built brushes that way. And once once I had made the set, the coolest part was I got to fly over to Sweden, um, where the museum is in Norway, but the, the ad agency that was putting together this promo was in Sweden. And I had to go over there and film this little promotion with them. And man, this is one of those business trips where like <laughs> there's 10% business, 90% just having yeah. fun. Yeah. And uh you know, those are, those are few and far between, but when they happen, you're just like, I can't believe this is my life. Cause I went, I've never been to Sweden before, went to Stockholm and I'm, in, I'm sitting in Stockholm and they do the shoot and it takes about an hour and a half. And it's on the first day I got there it was in the morning. And after that, they're like, great. Well, um, in a couple of days, we'll see you for a team dinner. And then in the day after that, if we need any uh, reshoot stuff, we'll let you know. I was like, what do I do till then? And they said, enjoy Sweden. So I literally, for like basically three and a half days, was just walking around Stockholm and having a great time, <laughs> doing nothing else. <laughs> so that's awesome. Amazing. Stockholm's amazing. Yeah. Oh my god! Like the Swedes really have it. They have figured it out when it comes to like uh, public policy that um, benefits the majority of the citizens and like everything. We could go on and on about some cool stuff about Sweden and how, oh, yeah. how well everything works over there, but. Yeah, it's beautiful. So that hey, was. Did a... you happen to see that the the big Viking ship? Dude, yeah, I bought the book. I have the, oh, the children's amazing. book, Devasa. Dude, yeah, that was cr incredible. They, re they for those of you who don't know, they reconstructed. Um, they had pulled up from the the ocean, the uh, the wreckage of this ship that what Jason yeah. had it sailed for like an hour and then sank no, immediately. No, no, like no. what's ridiculous about this. First of all, it's the biggest wooden ship ever built. Yeah. And it's gorgeous. Like it's just beautiful artwork and everything. Um, they went like they, they, they planned for, for years. They built this thing. They had, they filled the ship up with like 250, 300 people. It made it like 50 yards and it yeah. sunk and almost <laughs> everybody died. But what, what's funny is you see the design of it. They've got their cannonball holes below the water level. 
<laughs> Hello. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <If> I, <laughs> okay. I don't know why it sunk. <laughs> yeah, it was one of those. Uh, what's that? Uh, that Darwin Awards every year. Yeah. It was one of those kinds of things. Only a very expensive mistake. Um, <laughs> and beautiful, like you said, because they had yeah. done all this this wooden uh, sculpture. Um, you know, incredible carvings and sculpture that decorated the boat. And, and, and anyway, they, they finally dragged it all up. What, like 30 years ago, they dragged it up and spent several years reconstructing it and making it look as good as they could. It's and they amazing. stuck it in a big building and you can go look at it. And it's weird because, you know, you, you watch these, these Viking movies and series and shows and they're always these badass people. But what people don't realize is um, Vikings were only like 10% of the population um, yeah. most of the people were farmers and just good people, you know, you had like this group of people that were just, you know, you know, pillaging and all that other stuff, but like they were small people. That's the thing that it's like, you, th you see these big Vikings, they're like, Oh, and like, I'm, I'm like almost hundred percent Viking, uh, my bloodline, my brother, oh, wow. and I, my brother and I are big dudes. Like he's six, three, I'm six, one. Um, and, and we, we don't get cold. Like we're, we're full on like norsk and yeah. um and i went there and i'd be like holy i would be a giant if i went back in time um they'd be terrified of me these these vikings were like four foot something five foot like if at the tallest and if you look at their little they have because they pull out the skeletons yeah they've got, they've got the skeletons there they've got their clothing like it looks like little boots little teeny boots <laughs> like how did a man fit in these boots I, that's the thing they were my size made. basically i'm five foot oh. six <laughs> so i think you would be even tall for them because <laughs> I, I couldn't believe because then they like reconstructed actual people like they actually did like you know the sculpts oh, yeah, and everything yeah, yeah. And, um it's quite amazing i mean you can see the act because he recovered several bodies and, and everything but i was like man vikings were little these are, yeah. these, aren't, these are not like thor okay this is not <laughs> Don't don't get your your. That's Viking. the Hollywoodization of you yeah. know history that we we all know. They didn't so. get enough vitamin D back then or something. I don't know. <laughs> but um. But anyways, I wanna I wanna go back. So you, how, where did you get your start? Because you know, wh like I said, when I first came upon your your stuff, um, was Gumroad, mm -hmm. and I didn't know you for the illustration stuff yet, um. And I, but but that's the thing is once once I started seeing your brushes, I'm like, oh, this guy knows like, you know, because there's people I've seen making brushes and I'm like, ah, whatever. But but you you have to have a knowledge of um, traditional mediums and, and that sort of stuff. So then I started seeing your illustration work, your design work. So how did how did you get into all that? And then and if you don't mind, like what led you um, to getting into the techno technology part of it? Because for me, that's a that's something that. <laughs> I, I've never been <laughs> comfortable well, with it. Pro probably like <laughs> you and, and probably like most people you interview, um, actually heard you did an interview with Drew Struzan, who I, I had the privilege mm. of interviewing uh, for Adobe Max last year as well. He's one of my heroes. But yeah, um, he he said the thing that I've heard all of us say, which is yeah, I started drawing when I was a kid. and I just never stopped that whole thing. Um, and that's all I ever wanted to do. That's so, same for me. That's all I ever wanted to do. It's all I ever did. I mean, I had other hobbies and interests, but drawing was the one constant. So uh, when I went to college, um, I just went to a regular state school here, uh, UNCG, North Carolina, and uh, they had a really good um, fine art department. And I just got lucky because there were some professors there who were excellent at teaching drawing. So um, one in particular, Michael Ananian, just kind of like uh, broke me down and built me back up again with good hmm. technique and, and good habits and, you know, big to small and understanding yeah. value and all the, all the traditional stuff and the design elements we all have to know and understand if you're going to draw well or compose a good picture. So I had that knowledge. Um, I just didn't know what to do with it because there was no illustration program and nobody talked about illustration. And I didn't know illustration was even a job. So yeah. at the, the last year of school, you talk about the tech part. Um, I was panicking because friends of mine who were a year older or whatever had graduated with their art degree and they were going out to like manage Gap or Gap Store or Banana Republic or something. And so I was like, well, I want to do that. So uh, I taught myself HTML. And um, so I was, I was already playing around with Photoshop that year. And at the time, people like hand coding and building little websites was so fun and exciting and brand new. This is 1998, 99. Everyone was like kind of just having fun trying to build websites. 
So I did that and I managed to secure a little job at a web, a web firm before I even graduated. I was coming in um, twice a week when I didn't have class part-time. They hired me full-time out of school. So I did that for a few years, but of course, every day, every time I had a web project to do, I was trying to incorporate illustration in some way into it and just drawing. And I would sit in every meeting and just draw and I wasn't happy. And, um, you know, but the tech part of it fascinated me because I've always been into that. Like my, my dad, uh, brought home an Apple, um, uh, I can't remember the name, Apple IIe computer um, mm. when we were nine years old uh, because he had an extra one that was in his guidance counselor's office that nobody knew how to use. It wasn't bothering using. They let him take it, take it home. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been able to afford it. Because I think back then an Apple IIe was like $2,000. And if you look at inflation, that'd be like 10 grand today or something crazy. Whoa. It was insane. They were not, they were not like affordable home computers in 1985 or whatever. Um, but I, there was a book that came with it on, on programming basic code, and I just was making little stuff with it. So from that point on, I was like, this is really cool. I love drawing, but I also love this kind of stuff, whatever this is. Um, so anyway, fast forward, mm. uh, I was doing web design. Fortunately, I got laid off when the, when the bust happened. Um, after year 2000, there was this whole you know, e- economic uh, crash after 9-11, sorry. Um, and uh, I got laid off. And so I, I spent four months making a fake illustration portfolio mm. and shopping it around to design firms. Basically, I pretended I had worked for Nike and for like JCPenney and all these other companies. And I made fake stuff that I had supposedly illustrated for them, like posters and collateral and, and packaging and stuff. Smart. Because um, I was just like, I don't care. If they ask me if it's fake, I'll say, yeah, I didn't actually do that. But if the quality of the work is good, they'll probably hire me. And that's exactly what happened. This design firm hired me and I became sort of like an in-house illustrator for about four or five years. And that was when I started really understanding how to be an illustrator. And the best part was because we had clients that needed all kinds of different uh, illustration work for different projects. I learned about doing like wine bottle stuff, packaging for for beer, for donuts. Krispy Kreme was our main client. Um, Clothing, uh, you know, apparel design, um, packaging, poster, all that's everything, like everything you can imagine, editorial. Um, and so by after, after like four years, four and a half years, um, I was like, I want to be an illustrator. So I went to Society of Illustrators. I submitted one illustration and actually got in um, to their annual show. It was a portrait of Jack Black, um, which a lot of people actually, that's the one illustration they know me for, even though it was, I don't know, 15 years ago or something. <laughs> um, uh, from Tenacious D days, it was him kind of with yeah. a forked tongue and everything. That's funny. And it got into the show. So I got up there. I met, I met illustrators who were doing it full time. And I was like, I've got to figure out how to do this full time. So I met John Hendricks and Yuko Shimizu uh, that day. And I met some other folks who didn't remember me at the time. Um, Tim O'Brien and, and um, uh, Gary Texali and some other folks. Uh, so I came back to the design firm and I asked my boss if he would let me go to the Illustration Academy for a week as a professional student. And he said, sure. And I went and I, I met Sterling Hunley and um, Gary Kelly and uh, the great Mark English, who, you know, RIP um, yeah. and some other folks. And so that kind of like upped my level. And then I quit my job and uh, was was freelance illustrating, you know, like 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 all of us sending out promos and working my way up. So from like small magazines and small publications like alt weeklies and things like that to eventually New Yorker time and um New York Times and all those those big boys and everything and uh, that was my life for for about yeah like I guess seven eight years and everything was going great but we had kids and I realized you know I was, I was scared and worried about having to support them and also not killing myself working so much yeah. which I was you know you know the deadlines are ridiculous especially in editorial yeah so I started trying to find ways to make passive income um, and uh, I tried several things that failed. And then I made an iPhone game, which actually hit, and I made some money from that and was, was like, oh, could, maybe that's what I got to do. So I started making iPhone games in addition to illustration, but that didn't go anywhere. And all along, uh, the, the answer was right in my face all the time. I just didn't, you know how this is, where like, you're doing something and you don't think yeah. it's special or interesting because you've been doing it for so long. I've been making custom brushes for my own work since the days I was at the design firm. Yeah. because they needed so many different styles and because the deadlines were fast i did everything in photoshop but i made brushes for it so it didn't look the same right and i would work in different styles i was kind of like a style chameleon and uh 
people were, friends of mine were always like borrowing brushes, right? They would send me that brush you just used. I'm like, yeah, sure, whatever. And one guy, uh, Corey Godby, I don't know if you know him. He's a fantasy illustrator. Well, he's a sweet guy. Probably know the South, work. Yeah. yeah, I think he's down in South Carolina. Um, he had just opened a Gumroad page to send to sell his sketchbooks. And I saw that and I was like, whoa, what's that? And he told me about it. And he's like, hey, maybe you could sell some brushes on there. And I was like, oh, I never thought about selling them before. So I made one tiny little really like mediocre set, popped it up there. And dude, that was it. I, I, I put out one tweet and I put out one note on Tumblr and said, hey, I've got some brushes if anybody wants them. They're five bucks. Uh, at the end of the first week, I had $2,000 in from, from this $5 brush set. I was like, oh my God. That's awesome. Yeah, and immediately I just shifted focus and I kept my illustration jobs going, but I just hammered on the brush stuff. First of all, that brush set, I was like, okay, scrap, <laughs> scrap most of these, make them way better. And it, my, my, then my goal became to do what you mentioned at the beginning of the show, which was I wanted to make the absolute best natural media emulation possible in Photoshop through brushes and started focusing on, yeah, different media types that I love to use and that I wished were better and more easy and accessible in a digital environment and made those brushes. And um, it just grew organically for a long time. And after two years, I started like approaching studios like Disney and, and uh, Pixar and places like that and saying, hey, you know, I'm going to give you this trial set. I want you to try it. If you like it, let's do a licensing deal where you get them for your whole studio. And so I had licensing deals with um, Disney and Sony Pictures and uh, Sony Animation. I mean, um, a lot of the publishers in New York could do in-house art. Um, Weta Digital, they know they do like um, Lord of the Rings and all that stuff and some other places. Um, and then I could say to Adobe, hey, uh, these brushes are industry standard, you know, um, is there any way to, to partner with you guys about this? And that's a whole other story. So we can, we can talk about that if you want. I don't know if that's interesting to your audience or not, but like how that became then a, a business proposition that I had to then figure out how to navigate. And, and now I work at Adobe and they acquired the business, but that, that was a whole other process. You know, that's funny. We, I definitely want to talk about that. Um, uh, but uh, I want to let people know too, like, so I, I, like I said, I found you first on, on Gumroad. So, um, and you're still, you still have a bunch of stuff on there, right? You're still, it's not just the Adobe, right? You're still doing the Gumroad or? Yeah, I have a Gumroad page. Um, it has, it has just like freebies. So, um, there's like a paper texture and maybe four brushes. That's it. Okay. Like everything else I had to, I had to unload and, and, yeah. and make it part of the Adobe suite. But, um, I thought about putting some other stuff up there someday that would be resource-based, like resources for artists who are digital artists and like just tips and tricks and things that they could, that could help them but I'm just too busy with work, work uh, to get yeah. to it. But every now and then, oh, but yeah, I do use actually, I, I take it back. Um, what I do is I do, I do uh, temporary brush sets for fundraisers now. Um, oh, cool. So in the last, uh, what, since I joined Adobe, I think I've done four fundraisers, um, maybe, maybe five, I had to look back, but because I'm not allowed to sell outright Photoshop brushes because I'm creating them for my employer. Yeah. Uh, I, that would be a conflict of interest, obviously. Um, but if I can raise money uh, for a, a cause, the cool thing is every time I raise money through brush sales for a fundraiser, Adobe matches whatever I make because mm. um, they have a program for that. So I can raise way more money doing a brush fundraiser, obviously, than anything else because I still have my mailing list and I have social media. So like for the most recent one, which was for India for COVID relief, um, my, my fundraiser raised like seven or eight grand, I think. And then Adobe kicked in another seven or eight. So it's like, we're sending 14, $15,000 um, coming out of my one effort, which is <clears> fantastic. I could never do, first of all, I could never raise that amount of money on my own, just trying to do anything else. But the brush is really, you know, people, there's, it's, it's a win-win. There's no way you're not gonna give a dollar to get seven brushes that you're definitely going to use in your work. And you know that that dollar goes to do something good. So the fundraisers have been a wonderful yeah, that's sort awesome. of seconds. Yeah. I'm really excited about it. Um, and I want to do more of them. It's just that for me, it's a tax nightmare because um, I'm, I'm not a, an LLC or, or any of those things anymore. I'm just me. Um, so my accountant, every time I do one of these fundraisers, <laughs> they're like, Oh man, hmm. um, you got to figure <laughs> that out. 
because it because the IRS still looks at it as income for me. So then we have to do the math. Oh, geez. But yeah, you have to set yourself up with some kind of nonprofit, I think, to to do it. If yeah. you don't want to do the tax thing. I hate I all that do. stuff so much. Yeah, I hate it too. Um, so before I continue, though, just like I want everyone check out the Gumroad thing, um, and uh, and and pay attention if he's doing these um. Uh, these fundraiser things because it's going to be fun to mess up his taxes and everything. <laughs> it's also t- webster.gumroad.com. Yeah. I think they changed yeah. Gumroad recently to where oh. your name is before Gumroad. It used to be gumroad.com slash oh. your name. Now it's kyletwebster.gumroad.com. I'll have to check because mine was gumroad.com slash Jason Seiler. So I have to check but- yours now. I bet you're, I bet you it's Jason Okay. I have to check that. But anyways, I'll check that out and I'll put it up here because um, I also have a bunch of videos uh, available if anyone's interested. I've got some tutorials and I've got. I bought um, one of your videos. You know. Oh, wow. Which one? Years ago. Um, I don't remember which one it was. This was oh. like when you first, you popped something up, I think when I was in my old house, which was five years ago. Mm. Um, is that about right? When you put up your first tutorial, Pro- how long have you had prob- your Gumroad? Probably. Yeah. So see, the thing about what I do on Gumroad is because I teach at schoolism, I don't want to take away from schoolism. If you really want to learn from me, you can learn at schoolism. Um, I also it's, done it's, your schoolism. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's more in depth and it's more, you know, especially like the one-on-ones where I get to work with the people. But so the Gumroad, I try to set it up more as hanging out with me a little bit more. Like, um, you know, it's, it's more just ab- about drawing and just in painting, but it's, it's not like step-by-step step really, you know, uh, excuse me. Um, my most recent one though, I did, um, I, I did a, it, it's, I released it last summer and it's a painting of Humphrey Bogart that I did, uh, all in procreate oh, I saw that on Facebook. and, um, I did it in procreate and it was an experiment that I was really happy how it turned out because my, my whole purpose of it was I wanted to see if I could do a whole painting, basically zoomed out to the actual iPad size and try not to zoom in hardly at all uh. and, and paint it as realistic as I could from a disc that almost like you would with a real painting without zooming in. And, and it was a really cool experience because I do zoom in a little bit in it, but for the most part, the whole thing is done, you know, from the, the actual size of the iPad. And it was a really cool experience because you look at it and it's got a really nice realistic look, but as soon as you start to zoom in on it, it's just messy paint stuff. And I'm like, yes. Yeah, that's great. That's, so I, I have that video. It's available on there, but, um, but I'm I really to... glad you did that. Sorry to interrupt, but I'm oh, go glad ahead. you did that because one of the problems I have with digital art students is they have a tendency to zoom in and get something down to this level of detail that you cannot see when, yeah. uh, when it goes to print or when it's you know visible on screen. And it also is incongruent with the rest of the image. Mm-hmm. It, it's like focal points in the wrong place. Yeah. Rather than yeah. thinking about the focal point and point of your image, you're you're getting down to this nitty gritty. Yeah. How does can. it look? How does it look at actual size? Like, right. That's what people are going to see. Right. You know. Right. And I mean, that took me years to figure out because I used to like, you know, you know, I, I still go super detailed depending on like if a person's face is really close up, you know, um, because now it's about depth perception and that sort of a thing. But right. I'm really into to being more painterly now and expressive and just like what what can I show with less because it's also time management. And yeah, like, and it's it's a waste of time if you're rendering the hell out of something that doesn't like it's going to be printed this big or whatever. It doesn't matter. But I used to like spend forever just every little detail. And um, I was going to be the you know, I want to be the most detailed illustrator in the world. And and I, it was like all about being competitive and and, uh, you know, like like Mark Fredrickson's doing this and that. And I want to take oh, yeah, it like past Mark. that level and all this kind of stuff, which is a good thing. But then you start to look back and you realize like. Like it, no one sees it how I did it because no one has access to seeing it zoomed up. Right. So they only see it from this small thing. And yeah, it looks really good, but can I replicate that feeling with less brushwork? And sure. And, like, and you know, it's still you, like your, yeah. your voice and style come through. Yeah. No matter what you do, because you're Jason. So it, yeah. that work is going to be your work. So it, it, that it takes, it takes a little time to figure things out sometimes, but um, I was going to say how it's funny, like, and I want to get into the Adobe thing with you because so in 2013, I, yeah, 2013, I painted Pope Fran- Francis for person of the year for time magazine. I remember that man. That was your first and, time cover, right? Yeah. My first time cover. Beautiful. And um, that was a really cool experience because it opened up so many doors, um, 
I, I, different interviews and different things. And one of the contacts was, um, well, Wacom, um, they yeah. came and interviewed me and did a whole thing. And uh, they gave me a, 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 a companion Cintiq and uh, it was really cool experience. I'm like, oh, this is awesome. Um, and then Adobe came and they did a whole video about me. Oh, awesome. Uh, so it was great exposure and everything. And, um, and I remember they were like shocked because at, so up to the point of painting the Pope, um, I had been using like, I didn't have a, a, a Photoshop subscription. I had an old copy that was at least eight or nine years old of Photoshop <laughs> that a friend of mine gave me. And that's what I had been using for years. And all I've been, and they were like, so they're, they're trying to film me doing demos and stuff. And they're like, what are you using? <laughs> and I was like, I mean, all I use is the paintbrush tool. And sometimes I use layers, but you know, I don't really need, they're like, you do all this stuff with that. <laughs> and so they gave me a one free year subscription to the new Photoshop. And I was like, Whoa, this is cool. But I still barely use any of the things in Photoshop. Yeah. You know? And so, um, after the year subscription, I, um, you know, I've, I've subscribed because now I'm like, a, I'm addicted and used to the thing. But the point was, is that I, I didn't, you know, I only used like a couple things. So all these fancy things and whatever. Well, anyways, then they invited me to be the, the, the speaker at the Adobe Max conference in 2014. Oh, awesome. And, um, and that was a crazy experience because they didn't, I don't remember them clearly explaining to me what I was getting myself into. <laughs> I thought I was doing like a talk somewhere and I was like, oh, this is cool. Um, turns out it was a way bigger deal. I'm speaking in front of 8,000 people <laughs> in a, a huge auditorium and I got my, me up on huge screens and all this. There's a, it was, it was cra Plus there's like, it's like broadcasting live to millions of people. So um, I had a shot of whiskey at like nine in the morning because I was just <laughs> like, like I was opening for Weird Al, like like Weird Al was coming right after me. So I'm in a right, right. That was the, the Max <laughs> keynote. Yeah, That's I was a like, big deal, man. <laughs> I was the keynote speaker, um, and it was it was it was an amazing experience. But because of this, it opened up this relationship with Adobe. Um, I had a couple other things with them, and I was like, you know, I wanted to continue this relationship with Adobe because it's like such a great thing because I've been using your product for years and all this kind of stuff, and so. I was, I started pitching them ideas. I was like, you know, like, how about, and it's funny that I do the podcast now, but I was, I, I pitched them this idea. Like, you know, I'd really like to, cause they, they said they wanted to work with me and do more things. And I was like, yeah, like, you know, what if we do like this, like almost like a mini series, like reality series thing was where you guys send me around the, the country uh, with a small crew and we film me um, interviewing and hanging out with other artists. And we talk about our work and our art. And then, you know, we could do things like uh, we watched their technique and everything. And then I um, do a painting based off of their, what they're using and their tools. And, and I, I can use whatever medium they're using. I'll use it. And then I'll match what they do and, and I'll do a different painting and it could be a really cool thing. And they're like, that does sound like a cool thing. And then nothing happened. Um, <laughs> happened and then, um, yeah, I was like, I was, I was like thinking I'm like, I, if I, I got Adobe and then I, I, this is the funny part is I was like, I was like, you know what? for years I've been wanting really cool brushes, like, like brushes that feel more traditional, but aren't like trying too hard to be traditional. They're natural. And I said, what if, um, because, you know, I, I'm an illustrator. I do this. What if is, is there's someone that works with you that makes brushes that I, we could develop some, some really cool brushes together, you know? And like, I was like trying to do that. And then, Oh, wow. Yeah. And, you know, they weren't biting, they weren't biting my beefcakes. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> but they bought your beefcakes. Um, oh, so. well, not, not without a lot of um, <laughs> what I would call uh, all, almost, um, almost annoying. <laughs> on, on the, I, you know, you, there's like this really fine line between me being just an absolute pain in the ass and then just right under that, there's just being being persistent. And I, I, I somehow managed to kind of uh, <laughs> figure that out. But I think the key was I, I went to, to I did a lot of this. I did a lot of snaking, a lot of zigzagging, yeah. talking to different people until I found the group of people who actually cared about what I care about. 
And yeah. you have to remember, you know, any any large company, of course, there are so many employees all working on maybe similar things. Yeah. But there's always going to be this tiny group who their interests align with yours if you're lucky. And I found um, the Adobe design team specifically. And then on that team, I found a group of like five individuals who were passionate about illustration. Yeah. And that kind of stuff. And um, when I found them, I just held on for dear life and was like, every couple of months, uh, hey, uh, what do you think about uh, maybe, you know, maybe <laughs> I could do a live stream or something, or maybe, you know, we could do some brush promotion or whatever. And I did that for four years <laughs> until eventually <laughs> I, I, I was able to figure it out. But I oh, mean, you know, I need to go, go on YouTube and check out, I, I don't know if it's on there, but um, I'd love to see your keynote because that, that is such an awesome thing that you got to do that. I love that. That's amazing. Um, yeah, because those day two keynotes are, you know, worldwide creative influencers. Oh. And that's, that's such a huge, that's a huge honor. So congratulations. Yeah. For doing that. It, was, it was pretty cool. It was, it was a weird experience because like I said, I, I didn't feel like I quite knew what I was getting myself into. They flew me and my wife first class, put us in, in an amazing hotel, um, you know, the Kings of Leon was there. There was a huge party. Yeah. Um, and it was a very ex strange experience because I mean, it was a, it's the first time I ever felt like a celebrity because I, everywhere I went, people were like, are you Jason Tyler? And it was like, <laughs> I couldn't go out to eat without people. You know, I, I was like, this is what George Clooney feels like. Okay. <laughs> um, exactly the same. No, but it was weird really out. weird. Couldn't, couldn't go out to eat. Um, you know, yeah, the Weird Al thing was cool because we got to meet him and hang out afterwards. Oh, I'm and, jealous. I would love yeah, to meet him. He, um, I, got to, they, I got to paint him and the other keynote speakers. Uh, oh, so cool. when they came out, they showed my artwork. So that was kind of cool. So he, he was like, oh, you painted me? And I was like, yeah. So we got to meet. And then he, we exchanged numbers. And at lunch, um, my wife's like, because oh, I kept getting a text. She's like, who is that? I go, it's Weird Al. Like he's, oh, that's like amazing. He, yeah, it was cool. And then um, for a couple of years after that, he, he would send me Christmas cards. Uh, it's only only a couple of years and then he stopped, but uh, we, were, still we were sending fantastic. each other Christmas cards and stuff. But um, then there was a, this one point, like, I'm like, this is so crazy. Um, I had to go to a, a signing like there's like this. They wanted me to go to this other place and do autographs. And and I was supposed to have my book that just came out. Yeah. But my publisher didn't send the book. Oh, um, no. Yeah, it was, it was so frustrating because I would have sold every book. So I had this long line of people wanting autograph, but there's nothing to sign. I, and people were bringing me their laptops and I was signing their laptops with a marker. Oh my God. It was a weird experience. I'm like, this is strange. And then, and then, and then, you know, then at the airport, people are like running into me at the airport when I'm leaving. I'm like, this is the weirdest thing, you know? And then reality hits when you get home and you're like, oh shoot, my rent is due. And <laughs> You know? Yeah, that's the whole like, uh, <laughs> those experiences are always like that. Um, it's this huge high and then you're you, and also because yeah. you're in, it's weird too, because our community, you know, illustration and, and um, commercial art, whatever you want to call it. It's amazing because we all are so excited about what each other is doing. And yeah. we're, we're a passionate group of people. We're, we're excited, mostly friendly. Um, so when you go to an event like where you and I finally got to meet each other in person for the first time was Lightbox a couple of years ago. Oh, you yeah, go to an event yeah. like Lightbox, you go to an event like Adobe Max or um, Illustration Conference like Icon, um, which I, I'm so excited is coming back uh, next summer. Um, you go to these events and like for a couple of days, three days, you're just with your your favorite people and everyone's just giddy to see each other. And then someone like yourself, who, if, if they know who you are and they like your work, you get all this adoration and it's amazing. You feel like, Ooh, this is awesome. And yeah, you're right. You get home and it's it now, and then it feels <laughs> way too quiet. And you also feel like, Oh, I'm nobody. I, I stink, you know, still have to pick up your dog's poop. Yeah, exactly. Um, and it's weird. It's a, it's a very weird contrast. Yeah. And it, um, it never goes away. Like no matter how many times you go to those kinds of events, you do come back and there's a little bit of a sort of, I wouldn't call it a depression, but it's definitely a down uh, for a week or so where you're just like, oh, it man. is weird. It's a weird. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like when I got back from Sweden, I, I felt like that. I was like, wow, I just went on a trip. 
I didn't have to pay for it to go and do this cool stuff. I didn't mention that that trip was followed up by a week in, in Paris to do live streams as well. So it was like that, that whole week was that's awesome. surreal. I got home and I was kind of like, how come I'm not doing that every week? But yeah. of course you're not. Cause no one that's, that's not realistic. And that's what makes those things so special. And so I guess the only good that comes out of it is every time you do have a small opportunity to go and do those things, you kind of like really appreciate it more. It's like, well, I know that as soon as this is over, I'm going to be back to normal. So, you know. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I had a blast when I was at that Adobe thing, it was really cool, but um, it was, it was funny because I don't know where the miscommunication was, but um, the day before they brought me out on the stage, cause they wanted yeah. me to do a run through and I'm like, what? <laughs> like what i thought it was like a like a room like a conference room um no there max is massive man the i didn't stage. i didn't <laughs> i didn't even like i have friends of mine that are like uh they they're like graphic designers and they're like they're, they saw it and they're like dude you spoke for adobe you, you did the max conference and it's like i didn't know what it was really like it, it's i i was kind of like adobe offered me a thing i said yeah sure cool and they, they they paid me well for it and i was like this is great um so it was it was an interesting experience you know it was like my birthday that weekend too and <laughs> oh, man. Um, i was gonna ask if was it in back i'm sorry 2014 was that los angeles or was it in yeah like yeah oh god yeah it, it was, was near the staples stage. center i think the yeah, or was it was massive it's yeah oh it was huge and um the funny thing was is so i I kind of have this thing that when, when I do public speaking uh, for schoolism or whatever it is, I don't really prepare something um, as far as like, I don't like write out. I don't, I don't have like a, you know, a, a, like a necessarily an exact thing I'm going to talk about because I feel like this is the one time in, in the, in, in, in all time history that we're going to be together at the same time. This is a, it's never going to happen again. The same group of people, or we're not, we're not going to all be together at once. This is a unique thing. And I don't want to sound like I'm just like regurgitating everything. I want it to be real, natural, organic. And, and so I, I, when I showed up there, they're like, they want me to, to, to do my presentation. I was like, I don't have a presentation. And they're like, <laughs> what are you talking about? I go, well, I've got like 25 slides or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go through them. I'm going to talk about my work and what I do. And they're like, yeah, but what are you going to talk about? I'm like, you'll see, you know? <laughs> and they were like, that nervous. is not what they want to hear. <laughs> no, they were very nervous, but I did really well because I know what I'm talking about. I know my right. stuff. So, uh, but they made me feel really nervous before because they they were like well good luck with that you know and um but it it went well like once i got in front of everybody you know i, I made a couple of jokes like i i i was really nervous when i first came out and you can tell because i'm my voice is shaky and i mean there's like almost eight thousand people there yeah um Max and is intimidating <laughs> the first thing i did was i came out and i i did like an arnold schwarzenegger voice um <laughs> I was trying to break the ice and I was just like, Hey, California, you know, um, <laughs> <That's good. laughs> it was like, oh. um, and then I was like, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm not Arnold. I'm Jason, you know? <laughs> and, um, so anyways, yeah, after I've loosened up, it went well, but, uh, crazy experience, but anyways, it's already 48 minutes in. I don't know how much time you got going. I want to show you some fan art and everything, but I do want to ask you before we get going a little bit about the brush making process. Cause there's something that's, it's, it's, I'm curious about, mm -hmm. um, I mean, I could talk to you for hours, but so, but, um, let, let's just like, for example, like some of your gouache brushes. Yeah. So, um, how do you, how do you create a brush that emulates gouache or like the feeling, the dry time or the texturing or the, you know, like, like what goes into the process? I mean, are you taking real gouache and just, filming it or watching yourself do it um taking notes like how what's this process like because it's it's so even like your oil brushes or some of the different things that you've done where you've got like you know like the palette knives i love how some of those work it's just and it's and if you're actually paint traditionally those brushes are so fun to work with because you can really play with them so i'm just curious like it's one thing to just like oh i'm you know i'm a chameleon uh, making different brushes but it's like yeah, there's a little bit more going on there. 
<laughs> so yeah, and I've been I've been asked this before, and I always have a difficult time answering it because I do it several different ways, um, and I'm always I'm motivated by different uh, I'm driven by for, by different impulses uh, to do brush uh, creation. So sometimes the motivation is yes, I want to I, I desperately wish that I could paint something digitally that kind of looked like I maybe had used gouache, okay, which is a very it's a hard medium to replicate. Digitally, I mean, because first of all, um, if those of you out there who, who work with gouache know that you can reactivate it. So I, I, you know, I can't do that digitally. So there are certain things in, in terms of technique and process that are impossible to replicate really. Um, but just in terms of the, the finished look, that's mm -hmm. kind of what I'm after, I think, because, you know, yeah. with digital painting until fresco came along. And um, that was one of the things that I was, excited about when I joined Adobe was, was right at the beginning of them developing Fresco, which uh, those of you who don't know, Adobe Fresco is a free app on iPad and some Windows devices and iPhone, um, but it has live, live brushes, which are watercolor and oils that stay wet so you can manipulate them and play with them. And, um, and that tech I'm interested in pushing a lot further than where it is now, but it's yeah. already quite good. Um, but like, taking that out of the equation so when i was working before fresco everything you know you, you set you put a mark down it's there you can smudge it um but it's not the same thing so like it's it's kind of like permanent um which is not how it is to work with gouache or watercolor or any other wet medium um there's also a translucency and transparency even to gouache you know depending on how much water you use with it um so i wanted to be able to give people a suite of tools where they could get most of the looks that are possible with gouache using those tools and without some crazy amount of like manipulation and, and bother, you want to be able to just sit there and paint. That's the goal. Um, and so what I would do is, of course, I would start with a stamp. So I start with a shape that I want to drag around the screen that I'm hoping through tilt with the stylus and pressure, I will be able to achieve enough variety in that stroke so that it doesn't look like I'm dragging a circle around or whatever. Mm -mm. Um, that's yeah. one thing. So the shape of the stamp is, is vital. There's a texture file associated with it that I'll create that I want to be, um, you know, hopefully adding something to the equation uh, that is going to make it feel more, more like natural media. Um, this is not always necessary, but it, it can help. And with the gouache brushes, I mean, for some of them, I think it makes a big difference. Um, yeah, and then I think about uh, you know dual brush, which is this other brush setting. You can you can use a secondary brush to interact with the with the primary brush or the primary stamp rather, um, and how that interaction is going to again push me a little further towards that look I want. And what'll what'll happen is I'll sit around for you know for like the gouache brush set that I released originally, but I I I upgraded it a year later and I had what I consider to be a superior brush set. Um, with the gouache G, gouache golden brushes, um, those that that set of brushes, you know, it's something like that's maybe like six months of me just tinkering while I've got other stuff going on. But I'll sit there and just keep messing with it. I'm very very picky. My only problem when I was working with the brushes, which is not a problem for consumers, but it was a problem for me trying to hit my self imposed deadlines, was I just get so picky with brushes that I'll never feel like I'm there yet. I'm not, I can't release it. It's not good enough. Um, mm. I had that problem with pencils, trying to create good pencils. And so I would create a pencil and like a few months later, I'd be like, ah, I got to make another pencil. So I think I wound up making at least 10 or 12 separate Photoshop pencils just because I kept wanting something new or something different to happen with them. Um, so that's one thing, which is the natural media emulation. Um, with oils, it was easier because I, I just, you know, I, I understand oil uh, and digitally because Photoshop has mixer brushes, it was easy for me to then be able to get the right quality from those brushes where they can mix if you want on canvas and you can control those settings and everything else. Um, and then I, and I complemented those with regular ABR, regular traditional Photoshop brushes that use the same canvas textures and all those things um, if you don't want the mixing. So that was pretty easy, but um, but then there's this whole other process I go through, which now more than ever is what I rely on for these. I, I make a new brush set every, every quarter. And anybody that's got the Adobe Photoshop or Fresco subscription, once a quarter, you're going to get a whole 
new chunk of brushes um, and they're just labeled spring, summer, whatever. For those brushes, like half the time, what I do is I just sit down and I start making random shapes and I start making brushes from those and I start combining shapes for dual brush and I start playing with textures, making new textures. And it's very organic. It's very kind of free flow. I don't know where I'm going with it. And then suddenly I'll hit on a mark that I make with the brush that I love. And I go, I don't know what that is, but it is cool. And I'll start to then take that further and finesse it until I get to a point where I say, whatever this is, I can see myself using it for fill in the blank, mm. adding texture to this thing, emulating this kind of medium, um, doing background painting, whatever it is. And then I'll, I'll give it a name and I'll move on to the next one. And um, th so that takes me, hmm. sometimes it'll be like a couple hours working on something where I'll just hit something cool and be like, wow, it's fun. Other times I'll have something that sits around for a year. Um, and then there are other times where I discover something completely by accident, the halftone brushes, which I'm, I don't think probably would be useful for a painter like yourself, but I don't know. Um, but a lot of comics artists and a lot of illustrators are using oh, yeah, halftone that's brushes. really cool. Yeah, so they're the first brushes that were created that actually respond to pen pressure to create the to to influence the density of the the halftone dots, which is kind of a fantasy for people who need to use halftone in their work. Um, and I had fantasized about it for years, and I just couldn't couldn't crack the code. I couldn't figure out how to make Photoshop do that. And then one time, I made the mistake of using a soft edge. Um, I mean, a, bl a blurry sorry, a blurry texture for something I was making with a completely different goal in mind. And I don't remember anymore what that goal was. All I know is that when I uh, decreased the height, how we get, get, I don't wanna get into all the tech, technical, but I decreased the height, <laughs> the depth of the, the texture um, as, regard, as relates to pen pressure. And I started to drag it across the stream. I got the texture to show me, reveal more and more of the texture in a way that I was like, oh, wait a second. If I make that texture a blurry halftone pattern, I've solved it. And so that was complete accident. And it, um, that happens wow. too. So a lot of it is me playing around. Um, and I can't remember the, I wish I could remember my own quote, but I had a, a quote about this that I used at a talk, sort of a mantra that I've forgotten. So obviously not a very good one, but it was, <laughs> the idea was that um, invention, it comes from a combination of, of uh, playfulness, and accrued knowledge about a, a subject. Um, mm, yeah. So it's you, you have a lot of knowledge about a thing, but then when you get playful with it, that's where you then get inventive. And that was kind of the idea. And I think that's sort of the process that works for me um, more often than not. And also I think it's just an unhealthy obsession with this one very niche thing. I, I don't think a lot of people have the patience or interest to sit there and fiddle with brush settings for days and weeks and uh, months on end. It's not maybe that exciting for most people, but for me, it just happens to be endlessly fascinating. So yeah, there you go. No, that's amazing though. I mean, that, that's what it takes. You know, <laughs> some people don't understand why, like why people are into certain things, but I'm glad that you are. I'm glad that's your fantasy. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know what else, Jason, I realized in this is for just for anybody out there who has an interest in something. Now that we have a, a, a access to the whole world through the internet, um, your, your very specific interest that, you're, that you've become obsessed with can actually become a business or, a, or it can become a, um, a thing that, that uh, appeals to other like-minded people. And I, I think that that's an amazing resource for artists because those of, those of us who create maybe a specific kind of artwork who we think, or we think um, well, this isn't gonna be appealing to anybody. If it appeals to you and you're fascinated with it and, and just obsessed with it, um, we now know that there are thousands of other humans on the earth who are also going to like it. It's, and now you actually have access to them. So I was really fortunate yeah, that I lived in a true. time where I could create brushes that appealed to me. But I also had this community, the illustration community, knowing that it might appeal to them. And, and that just worked out. So I think we're really lucky that we have that, that access you know, to all people who are like us and they might like our stuff. It's cool. Oh, you know, another real quick, another a brush I want to mention that I love is your non-photo blue that you did. Oh. <laughs> like that just comes from me drawing with those and liking them. <laughs> yeah. So like the funny thing, I never use it as blue. I would just I always you know turn it to black 
And yeah. I, it's so much fun to sketch. I've done a lot. So every once in a while, I'll get like a caricature commission where they're like, hey, we'd really love to, you, you to draw Hillary Clinton or whatever it is. Um, we need it tomorrow morning. And it's like five at night already. And I'm like, OK, well, I don't have time to do like a full on painting like uh, but I could do a really cool drawing for you and then like, you know, throw in some color and it'll look really cool. And it's and it's like for the New York Observer or whatever it was like there's been a handful of those things. And I so I would just draw it with that non photo blue and it has like this great pencil texture to it. And um, and really one of my favorite caricature illustrators is Victor Huaz. Uh, oh, I uh, love him. Yeah. And, and his work is way more loose and sketchier. Um, but he does like, you know, like sketch lines with like some watercolor washes and stuff. So um, there's been times I've been able to like simplify my style, and break it down because they're only giving me a, like a day or whatever. And they're, you know, maybe their, their budget is like what I would consider a day rate. And so I'm like, listen, I'll do it for you, but I'm going to simplify my style and I'm only going to do it today. Like that's yeah, it. Right. And so that works perfect. Plus it's fun to draw with. Like it's, it's got a great look to it, but um I, I think it's perfect for like, like a, like spot illustration type stuff where I can do like a nice drawing and then just like almost do some washes of color. And it's like, Oh, that looks great. You know, you don't oh, have cool. to sit there and render the hell out of something. No, you but know? I like that. It's like Victor Juhas and, and other people, when they draw, they leave it all on the page. You see the yeah. evidence of the drawing developing. Yeah. And um, also what you mentioned, I think is so important for, I don't know who, who, I'm sure you have a, a, an audience that is, is made up of lots of different uh, kinds of people, including, I'm, a hope, I'm hoping, like students or people who are just getting started with illustration. And you just said something super important, which I want to uh, just reinforce the importance of <laughs> what you said, which was, I consider that kind of a day rate, therefore I'm going to spend less time on it. And then you tell the art director, I'm going to do it in this style. Like, it's yeah. so important to if you do have a labor intensive style, if someone gives you an option to, to do a project for what you consider to be less money than what that style, you know, is going to yeah. hours wise that you speak up and say something about it and then dictate the terms yep. under which you're going to do the work. Because I think too many people, especially when they're starting out, just feel like, well, I got to do what they say, you know, no, you can. And I've, I've done that many times where I say, I'll, okay, I'll do it in black and white for you, or I'll, I'll do a line drawing for you for that money. Like yeah, you, you yeah. always have, it's a negotiation. It's not a, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think exactly. That's really important what you said there. So I want to, yeah, I, that. I think it's important too. Cause I mean, that's after years of doing things, it's like, listen, if you really want me to do it, um, I would love to do, do it for you, but it's gotta be this way because you know, that happened recently. I, I, I was offered a cover um, and they wanted me to paint three people on the cover. And um. The, and the funny thing was, is they gave me the references they gave me were so terrible <laughs> um, that I was going to have to basically make up like there, there were there, there were it was paintings of saints um, mm -hmm. for this Catholic magazine. And there's no pictures of these people. There's old paintings or there's, you know, really bad old photograph of this one woman. And I'm like, th there's nothing for me to work with here. I'm going to have to make up a lot of stuff. And um but basically, when they when I heard their what they're offering, I was just like, no, I'm I'm definitely not going to I was like for, you know, for and it's through my agent and everything. So um, I have to think about, you know, you know, you have to think about the percentage your agent's going to get and all that kind of right, stuff. Right. Right. And so I, I basically just told him, I said, hey, for this amount, I, I'll paint one person. Yeah. Um, that's just that's just the way it works. Or. Um, and they were like, well, what if you painted two? And I'm like, well, it, it's going to be real loose and suggestive. I'm going to yeah. be very paint like, um, and, and I explained like, this is, and I explained to my agent, like, this is basically a day rate. This is not a great uh, amount of money for me to kill myself over. Um, and this, and as I said, I gave him like, this is what I, what I will do for this amount of money for this particular job. Um, cause also the other thing is you have to think about is, you know, so that doesn't mean that I'm lowering the quality of my aesthetic or the work I'm going to do. Like, I wouldn't take on a job if I, if I, if I'm not going to do something shitty, like, yeah. so it's still going to be good. It's go still going to have what I would consider my kind of quality to it, but it's going to be um, a, a more simplified 
looser version because that's what you can afford. Right. That's just, it's like, um, <laughs> like why, you know, why kill yourself? It's so like, funny to me how it, it, in illustration or art specifically commercial art, uh, the same amount of money doesn't apply across the board for like the amount of skill and, and, um, hours that go into a project. Like a, imagine a guy coming to fix your roof and yeah. like, <laughs> he says, all right, well, we've done the estimate. Uh, looks like it's going to be about $10,000. And you say, well, I've got $2,000. How about you do the whole roof yeah. for $2,000? <laughs> and then the conversation just stops there. That's, that's illustration. Yeah. For a lot of us. I mean, oh no. I and it's, and the other thing too, like, I can't tell you how many times, um, I get an offer for something and, um, and they want like a full on portrait and they're, they're and then they give me examples of, of paintings of mine that they like. Um, and I'm like, okay. And then, and then they, they, they tell me that it's only, you know, they give me like the offer of how much you're going to pay me. And I'm like, well, that's no, I can't do this. Thing. And then they're like, well, it's, it, that the price is because we're only, it's only going to print at a quarter of the page. And I'm like, that doesn't change anything. It doesn't, it doesn't matter how big you decide to print the artwork. I'm still doing the same artwork. Yeah. Like yeah, it's the always... same, you know, I understand that if it's a cover, you get paid more, but what, what inside the illust if I'm doing a full page in the illustration and you decide to, to print it that big, that's, you decided to shrink it. Okay. Yeah. That doesn't mean I get paid less. Like it's, it's, that's, that's a where weird you bust thing. out the pencil and you do a single black and white drawing. I mean, that, that's, like, that's yeah. what it's for. It's funny, man. It's still going to be a good drawing. <laughs> I've done it also before where um, I was told I was doing a full page and I got paid for it and everything. And I did, a, a, I'm really proud of the, the, the painting. Um, and then I get a copy of the magazine and it's like, they, they print it really little for some reason because something changed. And you're like, nobody <laughs> can even see what I did. Like, this is so strange. Like it, it, it the public, it's, it's an interesting uh, line of work. That's for sure. Editorial is um, weird. Yeah. Yeah. But anyways, I have some fan work I want to show you. Okay. Um, it's been awesome talking to you, man. Um, but I got some, I got some fan, some fan art for you and hopefully, uh, hopefully you'll be able to handle it. No. <laughs> so. <laughs> oh, oh, wow. Hey, that's really good. And it also, it's got my awesome, crazy, dark, big, fat caterpillar eyebrows. That is a really, <laughs> that is really good. I like that. This is by Ray Shipman. Ray Shipman. Ray, I'm. I love it. I also, I think I recognize in the back, background one of my recent paintings of a, a rabbit picnic. Um, oh, that's funny. Yeah. <laughs> but nicely done. Good line work. Good likeness. I appreciate it very much. That's really cool. You're going to appreciate the line work oh, on this one. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. I love this guy's stuff. He submits every once in a while. Um, Give that guy the golden nosy. Yeah, this is a uh, Pablo Salas. Um, yeah, I like I like how immediate and just direct his drawings are. Yeah, but the distortion too is fantastic. The pulling yeah. and the pushing, I absolutely love it. And um, yeah, for those of you out there who didn't get that reference, Golden Nosy is, but the, the, they have this uh, caricature convention every year. Oh yeah. Uh, I guess they don't do it. Haven't done it in the last couple of years, I guess, because of COVID. But um, the last year, no, I I've I've got a Gold Nosy somewhere in one of my boxes i knew you'd have one man oh, yeah. surprise me one bit <laughs> dang yeah, yeah i won in uh 2008 is when i won congratulations um, that's a good honor yeah it's cool it's a giant huge gold nosy sculpture it's a, it's a nose um, right <laughs> yeah it's a big nose golden nose and uh yeah you you compete with a bunch of artists for a week um it's an international like artists from all over the world and yeah you basically spend the whole week drawing and painting each other and then they have an award ceremony at the end. And if you win the number one caricature artist of the year, you get this gold nosy statue. It's pretty cool. And there's a silver nose and a bronze nose. Didn't um, um, the German guy, didn't he one time, I, I don't know if he would even bother showing up at that conference, but I think he did actually show up and do something. Who's that German guy who's so amazing? Are you talking about Kruger? Sebastian Kruger, Kruger. Sebastian Kruger, didn't he? he he's been there, year, like I think the last time was 2003. I heard he did a demo there one time and he was really grouchy and everybody talked about it. <laughs> <laughs> like he asked, people asked him questions and he just was giving like one, one word answers, but 
Yeah, I, I was there. I went all the way to it was in Orlando and I drove from Chicago to Orlando just to see Kruger because. Oh, no way. You were there. Oh, yeah. It was my first time going to the convention. And um, and uh, basically I, I was so I was bummed because I thought he was going to do a demo and he didn't do a demo. He just did a slideshow. Oh, no. And he, no and demo? He, yeah, he just did a slideshow and he pretty much showed everything I've already seen already. Oh. Um, but it was cool. I got to meet him. Really nice yeah. guy. It was the first time I met him. Um, since then, I've done I did a workshop in Austria a few years back and we got to hang out and um, actually got to be friends and stuff. And he's a really nice guy. Um, oh, man, I would love to see him work in yeah. person. I'd love to just watch over his shoulder, just watch him. He's amazing, he but he did get frustrated at the conference in 2003 because everybody kept at, at, he'd show one of his, his paintings and then someone would raise their hand and they'd go, oh yeah, what, how, what medium did you use? And he'd be like acrylic. And then, then they, you know, the next painting, someone would raise their hand and they ask the same question. He'd go acrylic. Oh man. And, okay. That's what it was. Yeah. Okay, I know I'd heard this story. I think him. maybe I, I, I might've told you uh, when we were at Lightbox. Oh, maybe. But then he got, after like five people kept asking, he goes, acrylic, acrylic, acrylic. Like that. He's <laughs> like, it's all I use. I don't use any. And then someone was like, what brand do you use? And it's like, oh, come on. Like, you think if you buy the same kind of acrylics, you're going to be able to paint like oh, that? Oh, but that's, of course, that's Psychopaths. the same thing as James Jean, like back in 2000, whatever. <laughs> people were like, what is that ballpoint pen you're using? And he's like, uh, it's this Taiwanese brand or whatever. And then everyone thinks they're going to draw in their sketchbooks like James Jean. It's like, no, sorry, that's not how it works. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's hilarious. Um, but the, the con they did have the convention last year, but it, they did online on, dis I think, Discord. Um, oh, okay. And okay, uh, cool. I was a part of that. I, I did it with them and I did about five paintings. And it was fun, man. So if anyone, like, I think this year, I think they're trying to do it in person. I don't know if I can make it in person this year, but um, it's going to be in Vegas and my friend Kevin Nealon um, is was asked to be a, a speaker, so he's going to be there and and because uh, he's been doing a lot of caricature paintings. Yeah, he draws. He doesn't paint. Yeah. He does draw. Yeah. Yeah, he's he's working on a, a book of his caricatures. He got a book deal. Of course, he got a book deal. He's Kevin Nealon. Oh, he's Kevin Nealon. So he got a cool book deal, and he's been working on a. He's doing about fifty caricatures, I think, for this book. So he's going to oh, be at the fun. at the International Society of Caricature Artists convention. Um, I want to try to go so I can hang out with him and stuff. And uh, also so I can do some stand up in Vegas, but um, it's uh, cool. he's going to, and, and also if I go, I'm going to be doing some paintings, but it just depends. They always have it in November and it's always a, um, a hard time for me because it's usually a busy time of the year for me to like leave work to go to the convention. Yeah. I like this one. This is very, uh, <clears throat> what's the word I want to use for this? Like you can see in the nose um, breaking down the, uh, components of the anatomy there yeah, <laughs> yeah. like those diagrams oh, yeah. <laughs> you see in 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 drawing uh like understanding the the anatomy yeah the planes the yeah the planes <laughs> and so on um nicely is, done nicely done that's, this is that's by hosian hosian Rezapur did this one that is definitely <laughs> me Rezapur, Rezapur. is that like a somewhere southeast asia i'm guessing uh the I origin am, of that name i am not sure Maybe um, Indonesian, <laughs> Philippines. Anyway, very, very cool. I like it. That's me. Good job. <laughs> oh, wow. That's me, too. These are all me. It's weird. I've never, you know, I've only seen um, a couple of caricatures of myself, maybe in my whole lifetime, just because I was hanging out with people who draw. Um, very rare. I have, a, I have like a three-line drawing by Steve Brodner. Oh, that's cool. Uh, yeah, when I was sitting one time at a lunch thing, he drew me without me knowing. And oh, then that's awesome. when we are we're leaving, he just slipped me a little piece of paper. But uh, obviously, I wish, I, obviously, I kept that. <laughs> I wish Steve Brodner would draw me like real quick. <laughs> oh man, he's he's the best. Yeah, oh, I love God. him. Anyway, uh, this, this is, is really this is really good. This is by Jacques Lemony. Jacques, that's that's Lemony. really awesome. Um, also, nice yeah. rendering with that cross hatching. Yeah. Now he, I love his 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 pencil work. It's really cool. Um, yeah. Yeah, he's he's a he does a, a lot of really nice caricature work. Uh, he also does a, like like comic book like cartoony work too. Is really cool. Yeah, this is good. Um, oh, that's yeah, that's me. <laughs> yeah, this is by Paula Petluani, and I think she uses acrylic. I was gonna say acrylic um, plus. Uh, no, that's all acrylic. It might be some like line. some Photoshop color added in there, I think. But but I think the work yeah. is all 
like acrylic. Nice. That's it's getting closer to almost a portrait than a caricature, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. That's nice. I liked I like uh like she's been sending stuff every, every week now for for a while. Um so it's cool to see like I, it's that's one thing that's cool. I, I'm you know, there's starting to be some regulars that it's that send in their stuff, and it's just interesting to see the work changing and uh, you know, trying different styles and stuff. It's kind of oh, cool. Cool. That's really satisfying. Yeah. Oh my gosh, yeah, that is <laughs> this is cool. This is Dominic really Zeilinger. Good. I love that. And I <laughs> love that it's based on my avatar, which is I've been using that avatar since 2009. Oh, um, that's funny. Yeah. Zeros that, and that ones. Is, that's dead on, man. Well done. <laughs> yeah, it's nice and design. The ones and zeros for the brush. Clever touch. <laughs> clever touch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's cool. And, oh, that's more painterly for sure. Yeah. This is by Christine Varadi. Um, yeah, I like her work. She's been sending a lot of stuff too. Really nice, uh, you know, painterly technique, brushwork, and everything. It's really good. Yeah. I assume that's. Um, it's like Photoshop, but I'm not sure. It, it's either that or I think I think she does a lot on the iPad. Could be Procreate. Um, yeah. Fresco. But this, this, you know, this one almost in a way, it's a little bit tighter, but it kind of reminds me of a Greg Manchester a little bit. Oh, I right? love There's Manchester. something about like the, the, the. Yeah, I know what you mean. You know, yeah. It's nice. He's, he's one of my favorites. Um, yeah. Believe it or not, he, he spent the day with us giving us a little coaching on uh, getting the fresco oils to behave better. Oh, that's cool. Um, but obviously, you know, uh, we need to spend more time with, with that, but, um, but anyway, he's, he's a, he's a, he, but this is really well done. Good job. Yeah. Thanks everybody for uh, sending in the artwork. That's really awesome. Um, yeah, but yeah. Hey, hey, Jason, before I forget, I want to tell you a quick thing about Mark Fredrickson. You mentioned. Oh Yeah. My, one of my, you know, uh, probably with you, but growing up, I had certain illustrators who I was obsessed with, all the Mad Magazine artists, Mark Drucker and uh, the folks in there, of course, I was obsessed with. But but um, Mark Fredrickson had done this series of illustrated ads for Levi's jeans. Mm. And one of them had a skateboarder with that that distorted, that sort of fisheye lens perspective he did. Yeah. And um, I liked it so much. I actually had it cut out of a had cut it out of a magazine and put it up on my wall when I was in ninth grade and <laughs> I had it all the, like like a poster on the wall but it was just an illustration by Mark Fredrickson that's how yeah. I was obsessed with you know and that that was one of those things where I'm sure you probably have certain images that stick out from you for you oh, yeah. as when you were in your your formative years as an illustrator and just thinking about drawing when you were a kid um that one for some reason just really grabbed me and uh I think it was just this idea that illustration can be so much more than photography. Oh yeah. The subject can be realistic, but it's the, there's something about illustration that makes it more, more real or more magical or whatever. And I just love that about, about paintings and drawings. And yeah, that's why, that's why I say like, um, like my, like I love being able to do portrait work for magazines, publications. I love being able to, to, to do this for a living yeah. um but like it, it it's and it's a, it's a huge honor for me i can't believe i've done personally the year twice now for time but the yeah. funny thing is is my favorite time cover and it's not even like I, it's not even my favorite piece of art um because you know it, it's there's a lot of things that come into play when you're doing illustration like you know maybe you could have done better if you had more time or whatever else so i'm not I, I think it's a, it's, it's an okay piece of mine, but, but as far as the honor of it, when I got to do a caricature cover <laughs> for time magazine, yeah, that was, that's, that's almost up there with me doing a cover for mad magazine because, um, you know, I I'm also like a, an illustration nerd as far as like, you know, like they, you know, just following different artists throughout their careers, like, um, there's only a handful of times that time has used caricature on the cover. Yeah, but, and, but fewer than probably we could count on one hand. Yeah. And so when they asked me to do Pelosi and Trump on the cover as a caricature, I was like, are you kidding me? I was <laughs> so excited. I did all these sketches and um, they all got turned down because I was pushing it too far. Yeah. Um, I made Trump look like a toad. And I was like, I was well, like, this is gonna, yeah, I was like, this is going to be hilarious. 
because Trump's going to see it. And I was like, oh, my, <laughs> this is ex- yeah. so I was so juiced up. I'm like, oh, he's going to be like the son of a bitch. OK, <laughs> you know? And, oh my know. god do that again oh my <laughs> god that's good it's fantastic, it's fantastic okay fantastic <laughs> tremendous brilliant okay um, holy god i didn't know you could do that that is good man. and um and uh yeah i'll tell you something in one second but uh about that but but that was such an amazing experience because um i i i mean i don't know how to explain it to, to be people that don't know but like you know, like when I was getting started, you know, my heroes were like CF Payne, Roberto Parada, oh, God, um, Chris Payne, you know, yeah. yeah, Daniel Dell, like, you know, all oh, these different illustrators. Yeah, wonderful. And, um, and so of course time, when I got my first time cover, it was a, it was a huge deal. But when, when they were asked me to do the caricatures, like, I can't believe I'm doing a caricature. I almost, I almost, the entire time I was working on it, I thought they were going to take it away from me. Oh, like I thought oh, something God, was going to yeah. happen um, that, the, the news cycle was going to change because that's happened. I, I did another Trump cover, which is one of my favorite covers I've ever done that I, I basically early on when he was elected, um, I had a really, a very realistic painting of Trump um, full body w- with a rope pulling with all his might. And there's a giant elephant leg. Oh, yeah. And, um, and it's, I, it's one of my favorite covers. It got pulled because the, yeah. the news cycle changed. And then for like four years, I had to sit on it. I wasn't allowed to share it until he lost the election. Um, but the fact that the, the caricature cover made it was like, I, that almost meant more to me than person of the year that I, I, got, I totally understand because you know, caricature is like my, yeah, yeah. That's like, that's the caricature. The reason I even started getting into this was what you had said is because I, I believe that a, a great caricature of someone is way better than a photo. And I wish that publications would be using character more on a regular basis. Our society is changing. Things are yeah, changing. It's weird. Um, caricature is seen a lot. I think people are afraid of it. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But I think especially with everything going on, it should be used more. It should be used I know. on a regular basis. And the smaller publications are not afraid to use it still. Like Alt Weekly yeah. use the heck out of caricature, but they don't have the budget. And it's just, you can't yeah, you can't I, make a living on that. I looked, I recently looked through an, an issue of Cowboy and Indians um, because my friend, Sam Cisco, a, a mad magazine artist for years, he used to have his caricatures in there. And I, I hadn't seen the magazine for a while. And I, I flipped through it to find, see his work. And there was the worst caricatures I've ever seen in there. I don't know who I'm sorry. I don't mean to offend no, whoever you I, are. I know, uh, I know, but, I know. but it was it's just like, it was cause that you can tell their budget that they, they can't get a real caricature artist. Sorry again, but, um, I know. but what I was going to tell you about the Trump thing is the voices is, is so <laughs> yeah. la- last night I did stand up. Um, I oh, haven't, cool. I haven't gotten to go out for a couple, like a month or so because we moved and all this kind of stuff. And so there's a really cool cult club nearby. And I was like, I'm going to go sign up. I'm going to do five minutes. Um, and, and, you know, I've got a lot of material I've been working on, but just, you know, I haven't really put it together. And since we moved, I had a lot of thoughts, a lot of different things, little ideas, but I haven't like written anything down just like all in my head. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to just go tonight and, and just, be loose be free i'm just gonna go up there i've never done this before i i always have my bits down and you know set up punchline whatever i'm just gonna go up there and i'm just gonna talk about what i've been thinking about and i'm gonna try to to be i'm gonna let's see if i can do funny you know let's see what happens um it's only five minutes um you know but of course i'm first they got me first on the list and i'm like (laughs) uh, so i get there and i'm like I, they have they have their, their name on these like this lights on this board it says jason siler i'm like oh my gosh i'm first like i was hoping to like kind of watch a couple comics and loosen up a little yeah yeah when i get there and they call me up and so i start talking about what it's like living in the suburbs versus in the city and and I'm, i was doing really well people are cracking up but then what really saved me is i just i, I started going into this trump stuff <laughs> and i just riffed on trump for like three minutes and i just i realized I, I have like three minutes of good trump material now oh good um, and it was it was great it was like i mean i i got up there and i said i said i said um anyone miss having a comedian as a president <laughs> and i just said that and i got such a laugh and i just let him laugh for a while and i just let him marinate in that i, I didn't know i was going to get a big laugh from that and then i just went on and i just did some weird trump impersonations like of him 
like what it's like when you ask him a question, how he responds to questions. Yeah. And I just was riffing and, and I was like, oh my gosh, I just, cause it's, a, it's kind of an amazing thing for me anyways, to just create material on the spot and it worked. So I was That's like, terrifying to me, but <laughs> it was, it was terrifying, but it worked and it felt so good. And like, right away I, I, I wrote Kevin and I was like, I was like, yeah. And he, he was like proud of me. So that was a cool thing, you know, That's awesome. Um, it's, it's terrifying doing the stand up already, but this kind of a thing, like, you know, it's a, Kevin was like, that's growth. That's like, you gotta sometimes jump in there and just like, can you be funny? Like, yeah. can you just talk and be funny? And, um, oh man, it was a good feeling when I was done and I sat back down, I was like, <laughs> and I, I ended, I had like a minute left and I, I was doing really well. I had a minute left. I'm like, I'm going to end on a joke of mine that I know works. Yeah. So then I was able to end with a bang and I was like, Oh, that felt good, man. Felt yeah. good. So, but I only get to go out maybe once a week if I'm lucky. Cause you know, the family and you know, I, you know, got to keep the wife happy. <laughs> hey, I mean, the fact that you can even go once a week is pretty awesome. Yeah. I wish I could go every night to be honest. <laughs> I want to do, I, I really be, enjoy I mean, it. You know, if you're, if you're getting laughs and it's going that well, um, I could I don't go need, every I don't... night. I have the, what I'm saying is like, uh, like my wife doesn't, she's not going to want me to go every night. <laughs> no, of course not. I get that. Yeah. I get that. But I have but the opportunity. the kids are a little older, I don't know. Yeah. I'm, I, I've got a show coming up um, on uh, August th- uh, 29th, downtown Chicago at the comedy, um, the comedy bar. It's Excellent. an actual show. So I'm excited about that. So I'm preparing for that. But anyways, how am I, I going to watch your stuff? Is there stuff online? You know what? Um, I will send you, I, I did, um, I don't know if you know the comedian, Steve Byrne, but <laughs> he's a really awesome comedian. He's um, on tour right now. He's working on his fifth hour, I think his fifth yeah. special. Um, you, I think on, you can find his specials, I think on Netflix or um, Amazon or something like that. Um, great comedian. He did the, he d- directed his first comedy movie, the opening act, excuse me, this last year. And I painted a movie poster for him. He's a, an amazing art, um, comedian, writer, director. Um, but he, he's the one that got me to do stand up. Um, mm-hmm. cause I had him on my podcast and he basically, you know, he says, you talk about comedy all the time. He's like, why don't you open for me when I come to Chicago next? And I literally, I said, yes. And I, I basically spent the next few months just trying to write a good five minutes and I actually did it and did well. And it was one of the scariest things I've ever done. And he invited me to do a couple more nights with him. And then two years later, back in June, like a a couple months ago, he's like, we're back, baby. I'm going to be in Chicago. You want to open for me three nights at the Chicago improv. So I did three nights at the Chicago improv in June and uh, it went really well, all new material. Um, but I will email you. I have the audio. I don't have the, I don't have a vi- uh, video, but I have the audio. I'll, I'll send it to you. Please do. Thank you. But, um, yeah. but this particular set, don't play it around your kids. Um, I won't <laughs> say this. I say some choice, some choice words. Yeah. Choice be- phrases at the very beginning. Yeah. But anyways, um, I just thought you would find it inter- interesting about the, cause you, you brought up the, you like the Trump impersonation. Cause that literally saved me last night. The Trump impersonation. <laughs> was like, I was like, it's Ivanka, really good. you know, <laughs> it's really good. Ivanka's a bitch. Okay. <laughs> um, but uh, anyways, thank you so much for doing this, man. It's really fun to catch up and, and, uh, and, and, t- and I, I just find what you do so fascinating. Um, and it's important. It's important. You know, like, here's the, th- here's the thing. I don't need the brushes. Because, you know, Photoshop's got their brushes and they work. They work fine. I used them for years. I also used a freaking Graphire tablet um, that was just crap. And I used that for like the first seven or eight years of my career. I did full page spreads for Sports Illustrated, whatever. I was with this crappy little thing. And eventually when I could afford it, I got a Cintiq. So I don't need the Cintiq, but I appreciate the Cintiq. Just like your brushes, I appreciate so much. And they're... Um, I encourage anybody, if you haven't, I'm sure if you're using Photoshop, you're using the brushes. So anyways, thank you so much for what you do, man. And, um, um, your illustration work, everything, um, by the way, I want you to send me some samples of your work so I can share them at the beginning. Oh um, yeah, if, sure. If you can do that. Um, I'm happy to. Okay. But, um, yeah. Can you let everybody know real quick, like where they can find you, follow you yeah, and all yeah. that kind of stuff. And- um, my website's kyletwebster.com. 
it's in sort need of an update, but that's okay. It's got everything there. Um, if you're interested in unplugging from the world that we live in and all the social media craziness all the time, I did a talk, a 20 minute talk. I always like to mention to people on the importance of boredom for creative people <laughs> and how being bored helps you to generate good ideas. Uh, you can find that um, from the 99U talks. Mm. Um, just search my name, Kyle Webster, board, cool. and you'll find it. Um, otherwise, I'm on social, of course. So at Kyle T. Webster on Twitter and on Instagram at Kyle.T.Webster uh, because I foolishly gave up my original username when I <laughs> quit Instagram one year after using it because I didn't think it was interesting. When I tried to join back, they wouldn't give me back my old name. Oh, man. Yeah. So anyway, that's it. Uh, I'm on YouTube Crazy. every week doing um, illustration masterclass for Adobe and also uh, a couple of other drawing shows and brush hour every other week where we talk about brushes. Big surprise. <laughs> so, that's awesome. That's me. Um, and if you have young kids, sorry, I got to make this plug. Oh, no, go ahead. Um, my picture book uh, through Scholastic is called Please Say Please, and you can still grab it on Amazon and elsewhere. Unfortunately, you can only get used copies, but it's worth it because um, the whole idea of the book is to get kids to understand how to use that word because I think it's an important word. Yeah. Well, that's great, man. That's awesome. Thank you so much. And uh, thank everyone for supporting the podcast and uh, tuning in next week. I'm going to have my good friend and illustrator Fred Harper on. Uh, he's oh, a, he's Fred. an awesome, yeah, an awesome <laughs> illustrator. Good guy. Um, and so we'll see you all next week. Be safe. Have fun. Uh, draw, paint, laugh, have uh, have some good times. Okay, we'll see y'all <laughs> next week. <laughs> you want answers?